um, an interest for us to be able to continue with part two. Um, and so with that, I want to make sure that we get a chance to cover um, all of that session three that we didn't get to in our first session. So I'm going to dive right back into it. Um, and it is good to see you all again. As always, please feel free to make active use of the chat and of your unmute button or your raise hand button. Um, much like our first day, we are going to stop and do a couple of um, breakout sessions. So you all get a chance to learn from each other because right now you are the ones who are in it and living this experience and um, like drinking from the fire hose probably I would imagine is what it feels like in terms of adapting to new normal or, or, or the, the way forward I, as I've heard a lot of people talking about it lately and I really like that. So really um, on session one of this tech EMI session we covered points one and two on the slide that you're seeing in front of you right now. And so today we're really going to focus on how you're adapting your technology to continue engaging with your supporters, your volunteers, your donors, your clients, and also how you're adapting your programs and services. So let's dive in. I thought it would be helpful to revisit this poll, which we did on our last session. So I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll on your screen just a moment here. Um, I think it, I would assume it'd be helpful for you all to be understanding from one another back in the office, who's always been in the office, and who's still kind of um, waiting and, and hedging before they head back in. So go ahead. There should be a poll on your screen now. I see people are starting to respond. Which best describes your status with return to the workplace? Again, we looked at this on session one, but that was now like a month ago. So curious to see what's gone differently. Okay, and let's see, right now we are 15 people and there are 10 votes in. I bet that's about right because I'm guessing that Hartford Foundation staff are not responding. So let me go ahead and end polls. I'm gonna share the results with you. So you can see again, um, many of you were already or always in the workplace because you were considered essential. So um, folks probably like Interval House and we've got several health um, organizations that are on the line. So you've been in there and working all along. Um, only a couple of you decided to start returning on May 20th, which I think is really interesting. Um, and then uh, the rest of you are waiting and maybe planning being a little bit more mindful to wait to return until you're a bit more comfortable. Um, thanks, Laura, for your comment. Um, Laura from Hartford Land Bank shared, we actually don't have a workplace. Um, you have a desk at a co-working space, um, and you put that on hold. If I remember right, Laura, are you the sole employee of the Hartford Land Bank, or am I confusing that with another organization? No, Lindsay, you have that correct. Yes, I'm the sole staff member. So we actually, due to the pandemic, we put hiring additional staff and, uh, and searching for a permanent office space on hold. Yeah, okay, great. Anybody else um, that has purposely chosen not to return just yet? Any thoughts um, on the rationale or the thinking there, or just trying to wait a little bit longer to make sure everybody's comfortable or is working from home going so brilliantly that, um, you know, no, no reason to hurry back? Takesha, I see that your hand is raised. Feel free to unmute and share. Yes, yeah, so um, I haven't, I have thought about permanently not going back. And then I have a staff who really apparently enjoys um, being in the office for a multitude of reasons. So we're going to start doing a rotating schedule on Monday. Okay. Very at interval, excuse me. Just burst in there. Um, at Interval House, we cut staff back that would stay in place as much as we could. Um, and we are returning. Uh, we are beginning to return. Um, but we are still, everyone who can work from home is going to do that, but we will be rotating staff in more staff into the courts and so forth. So we're sort of split. Um, what the decision I made was that we would continue that until uh, mid-August or Labor Day and take a look at um, the environment then. Right, right. Great, thanks Mary Jane. Yeah, we're, um, and I see, oops, sorry, go ahead. We're pretty much the same. We have uh, 
some of our accounting department coming in on a rotating basis, and that's just because we need to close out our year with grants and, you know, payroll, making sure everything's getting paid and signed. But as far as our um, programming goes with youth and families, that's all, all going to remain virtual for the summer. And same with our clinical program, we'll stay on a telehealth platform. So we're just going to kind of ride out the summer, see how that virtual platform goes and um, yeah, kind of go every few weeks, reassess. Right. Okay. Great. Yep. And I see Brandon shared in the chat as well. And then we'll go to Debbie. Um, thanks, Brandon. You were saying that it's working so well to have everybody working from home. Um, at some point, you'll probably just have one to two days in the office. And then I see that Bill just shared as well. We have had some in-office time staggered and solo for a few essential tasks, but otherwise remote. Uh, looking at states reopening guidelines and don't believe we could comply with them and self-certify. So remaining in phase for some time. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Bill, thanks both Bill and Brandon for your comments. Debbie, um, you had your, your real hand up. <laughs> <laughs> um, being a museum, we opened on um, May 20th, our outdoor exhibit, and we'll be opening the whole exhibit hangers um beginning on june 19th beginning on friday so i've been in the office to maintain uh taking care of the big facility and things like that uh this week we'll be able to bring back the staff we furloughed and we're able to maintain the guidelines that were given by the state so we will be opening for business then and lindsay Great. um i just this is mayor i just have a uh quick comment, which is given that we're talking about reopening, I just wanted to remind folks that um, we're hosting a webinar this coming Tuesday, the 16th from 9 to 10, 15 a.m. And it's around uh, legal issues related to reopening. So if folks haven't registered and would like to, um, you still have time to do that. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, okay, well, so my hunch was right that we're all thinking about this somewhere in the midst of it. And um, I'm glad you all got a chance to share and talk about it. You know, what I'll say, and you're all probably very much aware of this, is um, this hybrid state that many of you have just described, I think, is um, going to be something that's around for quite a while. And I think we're going to see it with businesses, both big and small, as well as in our own nonprofit community that um, it, it might never look the same again, or if it does, it might be a long time. But this idea that maybe we won't all return to the office, or some of us will and some of us won't, or it'll rotate, it'll be half and half, um, I think that's very much what we're seeing as the trend overall. And, um, and that the economy, that our, our workforce and our workplace will be a bit more hybrid to the extent that it can be going forward, either for reasons like what Bill was saying, which is, we, you know, it, it's going to be burdensome or impossible or costly for us to comply with the guidelines or because, you know, there are just some staff that, that have to be in the office. Um, you know, or to, or to the other example, for some people, continuing to offer virtual services might be the right thing for your communities because, you know, being from home is where they're safest or where they have to be for, for any number of reasons, although we know that that's not always the case. Um, you know, so I think um, it will continue to see this kind of a blended approach. And so be thinking about, and now is a great time, if you aren't already, to be talking with your employees, to be looking at your employees. Um, and asking yourself, you know, who seems to be really doing well working from home? Who's really happy and comfortable and productive and autonomous working from home versus, you know, who might actually really benefit from being back to the office? Um, and how might you be able to help um, get employees, even if it's staggered or it's a little bit of that hybrid approach? How can you help support in getting them where they can feel most successful and be most productive um, and get the support that they need? Um, so really interesting to hear where you all are with that. Let's dive in and start talking about um, your engagement and communication with your, with your stakeholders, with your supporters. Uh, I'm using that in the broadest sense of the word. I mean, now we are three months, almost three months into this thing. So um, you've, you've probably really started to learn the ropes here, but I think that many of you have already adopted virtual meetings and cloud sharing um, or cloud file sharing with your board um, in order for you to keep moving forward with them at this point. Um, I would encourage you to think about what parts of that have been helpful and might be worth keeping. Um, again, as you consider to think about a hybrid um, approach going forward, 
Um, the other piece of that, and um, it's interesting because I see that also Amy from the Hartford Foundation is, um, is on the call as well, and she's the one that had shared more with me about the virtual volunteer program that, the, or I should say the pro bono volunteer, skilled volunteer program that the NSP at the Hartford Foundation had started, um, which I think was always going to be virtual, and it just ended up being really convenient that during this time there was a launch of a virtual volunteer program Many of you may have heard of it. I'm not sure how many of you have participated, would be interested in a show of virtual hands or, or you know, your actual hands. Um, but what I've heard is that many nonprofits in the area are working with Catch a Fire, which is a service that's matching nonprofits with um, skilled virtual volunteers. At the time that Amy last updated me, 30 orgs have been matched with 23 volunteers and are working on 35 projects together, including things like graphic design, coaching on meeting remote meetings or remote learning, uh, social media audit, audits, creating email templates, video editing, et cetera. Um, actually, we're going to hear an example from one of your colleagues here on the line today about using volunteers to help do a virtual event. Um, and so, you know, if you're an organization that has normally used volunteers in a very physical way, and maybe you're still doing that with social distancing guidelines in place, but you're wondering, you know, how could you still keep people engaged? Um, if you haven't already, consider talking more with the NSP team about the Catch a Fire virtual volunteering program. It sounds like there are quite a few organizations in the area um, that are getting some, some skills volunteering at a distance that could be really helpful during this time as you're navigating new waters. Um, Sorry, let me let me move on here in my actual slide here. Um, again, I think many of you have probably already have probably already started doing this at this point, but now is the time to keep communicating early and often with your supporters. Um, and what I would say is uh, some of the basic rules have not changed. That is prioritize the basics: your website, your email list. And, and strategy for communicating by email, whether that's e-newsletters or e-news blasts or email blasts or whatever it might be. Those two things, or those three things really together, the website, a good database of emails, and then communicating via email. You know, yes, we have to do things via social. Yes, you might be doing things via other comm strategies, but those three main things are still the best return on investment for your money. So making sure that the website is current, has been adapted as needed to reflect your new reality during this time, making sure that it's super easy and obvious how to find, how to donate to, volunteer for, or support your organization during a time of COVID right up front, um, but just having that, that solid and current website in place with a good email list and an email strategy to communicate with folks during this time to let them know, what are you doing? What are you struggling with? What do you need? Um, how are they doing? Um, and, and even making phone calls, you know, just picking up the phone, and I'm sure many of you have already done this, talking to your board and your donors, your major donors, your, your longtime volunteers, um, that's going to continue to be really important as well. Um, related to the email list piece, now is an important time if you haven't been thinking about it already, and if you do think that you're going to continue to be operating some programs and services or to some extent virtually, um, if you're thinking about, oh my gosh, we have a huge big fundraiser coming up, we need to move that virtually, you need to be asking yourself, how are we building or engaging our current audience? Because that's who's going to show up or not show up. Um, so how are you building or maintaining that audience in order to help you achieve your virtual fundraising, your virtual revenue, or your virtual sponsorship goals? All of those are impacted by, the, by whether or not you actually have an engaged virtual audience. So for example, if you're thinking of shifting a fundraiser virtual and it's a sponsor-driven fundraiser, how can you tell that sponsor that you're going to continue to meet the visibility goals because you've got a big social audience or a big email newsletter audience or a big audience is going to show up to that virtual event. So ask yourself, what's, how can we build that audience? Is there um, a key value add that we can continue to deliver to our audiences during this time, whether that's a uh, through, um, through a, a blog or a newsletter or an online performance or maybe trying your hand at podcasting um, or a white paper or report, like how can you offer something of value that continues to engage your audience or attract a new audience 
so that you know when you do the online event, whether it's a fundraising event or a, a program or a service oriented event, or you know you're trying to convince sponsorships, you still have the reach. That audience is still there. Maybe it's big, it's healthy, it's engaged, um, and you can um, continue to deliver services that are actually reaching folks. Um, and lastly, now is a really interesting time to explore digital fundraising options and marketing automation tools. Um, you may not be doing a lot with marketing automation. Many of you are pretty small organizations, but as small organizations, some degree of marketing automation can actually be really helpful. So, you know, if you have canceled an event or some of that event budget is not getting used the way that you thought it might be, is there a way for you to repurpose some of that event budget to invest in created automating nurture streams where if somebody does download a white paper from your website, you have an automated nurture stream that sends them to your blog, that invites them to sign up to your email newsletter, that tries to pull them into your organization with a drip, drip, drip of ways that they can engage with you. Um, Maybe it's an automated nurture stream for volunteers that sign up to do something virtual and then you bring them back in to help with the next volunteering effort. Um, but setting some of those things up as automated can help free up your marketing, your development, your fundraising, your outreach staff um, to be able to try new things because some of that um, outreach has been put on automation and you might already be using tools that have automation features built in and this would be an interesting time for you to be asking your team your staff who looks after those things to look into that and see is there anything that we could do to automate some of the things that you're doing manually to keep that engagement level high similarly this is a great time and many of you have probably already been doing this to start understanding what bells and whistles or tools, maybe your CRM, your donor database, your client relationship management tool or donor database have available to you that maybe you haven't been using or haven't been using fully. Um, taking some time to, to let staff do some of the training or the, the coaching that might be available or tutorials to think, you know, hey, we've been paying for Little Green Light or we've been paying for, um, you know, Razor's Edge or we've been paying for XYZ tool is there, are there other features in there that we could be thinking about using as we move into a world that's doing fundraising more virtually or events um, more virtually? So I wanna, um, oh, sorry, last quote I'll just share here. This is from Ben Miller who leads Donor Trends. When the current crisis ends, history will show that the most successful nonprofits continue to ask for donations, although likely in a different way. Um, let me pause here and I want to just do another quick poll um, and ask, um, you know, really when it comes to these big events, fundraising or otherwise, you've got three choices, cancel completely, reschedule or postpone, or shift to virtual. Um, and I'm guessing that many of you have already done one of these three. So bear with me one minute as I switch to my second poll here and launch this for you. And I'd be curious to hear more from you all about which best describes your status with regards to events at this time, um, particularly if there are large events, but anything goes, we've canceled, we've postponed, we've moved, um, and maybe you've done more than one of these. If so, feel free to chat or, um, unmute yourself and share, but I'll give folks a moment just to read through these options and to share the one that's feeling top of mind for you right now. And again, you might have done more than one of those. Feel free to um, go ahead and share that in the chat, if so. Okay, and Takesha doesn't do events, nor does Shane, totally fine. Okay, let me end the polling here. I'll give you a few more seconds if you haven't, but that's 12, oh no, that's six responses. So the let me give you a little bit more time. At all. Sorry, say that again? The poll did not pop up for me at all. Oh, it might be um, either it's hidden on a screen or it might be if you're on a different device, but feel free to tell us um, what you've been doing. Is that Andrea? I Do you want to share verbally I, whether you've canceled, postponed, or moved? Uh, oh, you found it. Yes, I found it. So we have canceled one, and we are moving our large event to uh, online, 
in September. So we're hopeful that it's going to be um, just as exciting as in person. And it's going to be something, um, it's going to be a concert online. So we're hopeful that everyone Very. will join us and celebrate. So that's what we're going to be doing. Very cool. And I'm, sh I'm sharing the results now. So hopefully you can see that we've had, and again, some of you like Bill have done a combination of those. A couple of folks, Jane and Takesha, don't do events. Um, but we've got, you know, some folks have canceled. Some folks have postponed and the majority, four of six of you, of course, we have a small sample set here, but many of you have already moved an event from in person to online. So I'm excited to give you a chance to start sharing more about your experiences in doing that. So let me go ahead and close that poll for right now. Um, be curious as you move into breakouts to have you share a little bit more about as you've been taking those events virtual, um, have you seen a reduction in operational costs? Um, certainly that's a possibility. How does that compare to your um, ability to earn or to fundraise and, you know, have the, have the cost shaken out with your ability to raise money. Um, some people could potentially, some more people could attend. Um, so there's an event that I'm part of sponsoring called the Social Innovation Summit that just happened last week or the week before. Normally an in-person event caps out at about a thousand people. They moved it online and um, they, they were having, seeing attendees of about 4,000 or 5,000 instead of the 1,000. Um, so it can mean that you get a bigger audience outside of your normal catchment zone um, and have more people attend. I think there's a question of, you know, whether the engagement is at the same level. Um, and again, depending on the event, not so much for fundraising events, but for other events, for productions, for trainings, when you do it online and you record it, that's giving you a, a piece of content that you could potentially reuse either again to help grow your audience or potentially to monetize um, or to help deliver and repackage and reuse content throughout the year that could add value. Um, yeah, so Brandon is saying that it was reduced cost but also reduced revenue, um, but an exponential increase in attendance and donations. So that's really um, interesting to see. Let's go ahead and um, I wanna share it with you um, from one of your colleagues, what their experience was. Hear a little bit from your very own Mary Jane Foster of Interval House, who just recently moved their fundraising event online. Um, and I'm gonna share a quick video and then have Mary Jane share with you a little bit more about her experience then have you break up in breakout rooms and, and talk amongst yourselves a little bit more about what you're learning, whether it's events or even just asking for, for donations or continuing to do your normal fundraising um, online, even if it's not through a virtual event. But let's start with a quick um, fun video from the recent Interval House online gala. Okay, so thank you, Mary Jane, for being a great sport and letting me share that. Oops, sorry. We're going to go ahead and move on. Um, yeah, so um, very, very fancy, Takesha. I love it. Um, and I saw a lot of you smiling as you were watching, which is the same experience that I had. Um, so depending on how closely you're tracking each other's movements here, um, Interval House, I guess it was about a month ago already now. It seems like it was um, more recent than that, but time is flying. Uh, Mary Jane Foster and her team moved the gala online, um, powered by volunteers, had 200 people sign up, 140 attended live, had set a fundraising goal of 100,000 and were able to raise 102. Uh, Mary Jane can share more um, about that. I know that it was, um, that was what she described as um, a very needs-based budget. This was not to like, drive a surplus. This was like to meet the basic needs. Um, so it was both an aggressive goal for a virtual event, which they had never done before, but also just to really help them continue to offer the basics of what they do. Um, and so thanks, Mary Jane, for being willing to share a little bit more about your experience. 
Um, I'd love to just have you speak a little bit to what were some of your key steps on the decision to go virtual and how did you approach that before you decided to go from um, the physical gala to uh, an online gala? Well, it, um, I came back from vacation as the world, as we know it, blew up. And so I came with a perspective that this was, uh, this was going to happen in full. There were no half measures that were going to work. So we went to a, a major shutdown and I looked at all of the events. I mean, spring is Hartford's time to raise money. And I realized real quickly that we had to go virtual. All I knew about stay at home fundraising events was there, there have been some that have been hugely successful. There was a, a tea in the South where you received a little card and a tea bag that said, enjoy your tea, stay home and send us a check. And they raised tons and tons of money. So I knew that you could do a stay at home. I, I wasn't at all sure how we would put it online, but we made the decision uh, without thinking any more deeply than this is, this is the only option we have. Um, I knew right. others were canceling. I knew others were postponing and there wasn't gonna be a lot of space. So um, I would think um, the, most, the most important thing that we did, I think, is coordinate our social media efforts and um, create a campaign that was very consistent and really coordinated and um, not relentless, but it was, I mean, it was just very regular. Uh, initially, when we started, folks said, this is not funny. You can't do something funny. Nobody's laughing. So we were quiet for a little bit. Uh, and, then, and then when by the time we, were, we, we launched, um, everybody had been at home for a few weeks and we were you know, all still here. And we were able, um, we were able to, to, to have a little fun with it. Um, Right. To, to Brandon's point, I will say, um, we, we had people who had never come before. Our ticket to the society room is a $200 ticket. Not everybody can do that. So we had mm. new friends and new donors. Um, mm. uh, and additionally, you know, we cut out $35,000 worth of expenses. So I want to ask you more about that, Mary Jane, because you might see in the chat that, um, you know, Takesha jokingly said it's very fancy, and um, uh, Laura said, can we hire, and now Takesha's agreeing, can we hire Mary Jane to host our own virtual fundraisers? I thought it was really interesting um, to, to understand a little bit more about how you pulled this off. Can you talk about um, who planned this and the role of volunteers in your event? Well, um, I give all the credit in the world to my development director, Amanda Delora, who, um, who really created the plan to make this happen and, and also put together uh, the videos. And we have um, good friends at Slalom and uh, she reached out to them because we knew there were technical options, but we didn't know what would work best. So we had three volunteers uh, from Slalom and they, the company gave them time so that they could help us and they also took uh, their own time to help us. And, um, and put it all together. <laughs> and I will just, I tell, I tell everybody, it's like walking out your window onto a high, high wire with no net, because you, you just don't know what's going to happen. But, you know, we got to that, we had done a run through, and uh, everybody convened at Silk City in Manchester, that was going to be the technical hub, and they lost power. So everybody ran over to Amanda's dining room, and uh, the virtual gala started there. And I, you know, I just, we had such amazing talent in our volunteers, I didn't worry about a thing. So I, I came on, I got about halfway through my introduction and uh, I heard one of them say, Mary Jane, you're gonna have to start over, we had no audio. So <laughs> I had to start over. Uh, but right. then it went very smoothly. We were the first live, um, gala. 
the Hartford Symphony did a pre-recorded gala that was absolutely wonderful, but you know, they've got a symphony orchestra, so um, obviously it was wonderful. But right. we, we uh, shifted from me in my living room, where I'm sitting right now, uh, to a couple of pre-taped um, messages from sponsors. And then mm -hmm. uh, our MC stepped in and then um, we had a mission moment and then I closed it up. And it was, uh, it was scripted to be 40 minutes. I think we went 49. Um, at the very end, after the mission moment, uh, we we turned it over to a young woman who um, who played the guitar and sang uh, "You Are Beautiful," and and somehow that switchover bumped a number of our viewers off. So mm. so we the next day we sent out a thank you with a link towards uh, oh, to the, nice. the full event, but that's just a, a, a too long a way of saying expect technical glitches. If I had to do it over, I would have done a full run through. Um, but again, you know, this is this is all new for all of us. So there are going to be glitches. The good news is that everybody is in a frame of mind to forgive you for it. Um, nobody's right. holding you to, you know, standards that are impossible to meet. But it, it right. was a wonderful experience. I'm really glad it's over and I've done it once. <laughs> uh, it's not nearly as terrifying as it, as it was that night. And I mean, it was, all you could do is throw it out there and hope for the best. Thank you so much for being willing to share a little bit about the experience, Mary Jane. And I think the learnings of relying on um, the graciousness of volunteers where you can, you know, there are some folks that have these kinds of skills that can help combined with your superstar staff, you know, expecting things to go wrong, being willing to pivot when they do, and, you know, for next time, doing that dry run, all really great lessons. I know that a number of the other folks on the call have, have done this as well, so I'd love to actually turn it all over to you with kind of that fun video and, and Mary Jane's experience as a, as a starting point. There's a couple of other examples in your slides, but um, once I knew that we had one among you that I could um, feature, um, I'll leave those in there. There's links in there for you to take a look at them on your own. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and have you go into breakout rooms just for a minute and share more about what you're learning. And for those of you that maybe aren't doing big um, virtual events like this, um, never have, never will, um, totally fine. Let's, you know, feel free to talk about how you're adapting fundraising in this time anyway and what you're learning and what's working. Um, I believe that as of right now, there's 11 of you out there. So, I'm going to put you into three rooms that'll give us four, four, and three. Um, and we'd just love to have you share your wisdom, what you're learning, you know, maybe the hard way right now about moving events online. What are the factors that you're considering in making those decisions? And what did you learn or are you learning as you're doing that? As a reminder, when I click that breakout room button, uh, make sure that your video is on. I think it is because I can see you all. Unmute yourself. Um, it'll automatically put you in the breakout room. Actually, you don't have to click join breakout room. I've set it to automatically do that. Um, and then when there's about a minute left in your time, I'll send you a little um, a text to let you know that. I'm going to give you 10 minutes in breakout to talk through this. Um, and when, uh, when I click end breakout, you'll have 30 seconds to finish whatever conversation you're on, and it should automatically bring you right back to us. Any questions about the logistics of breakout rooms before I give you all a chance to share what you're learning and doing and experimenting with each other? Okay, just a note to Hartford Foundation staff that are on the line with us, it'll automatically put you in one of those breakout rooms. Um, I can't stop that. So if you can just back yourself out of a breakout room, if that means that one of them gets really light, I'll do some quick moving around. Um, so that everybody's got a full session, but um, Amy, Mayor, uh, uh, Betsy, if you can just exit the breakout room right away and then I'll make adjustments as needed. All right, so I'm going to leave you for 10 minutes um, and I'll shoot you again a one minute warning and um, look forward to hearing back from you when you get back. I would also welcome um, a quick update from at least one or two of those breakout rooms. There will be three about what are some of the highlights of what you're learning. Um, and the, the factors that are weighing heavily on your decisions. So be ready to have a, a spokesperson share out a few key learnings when you get back.
Okay, sorry, I'm just... Um, checking to make sure everybody's in a good spot. Okay, but there we go. I'm going to open you all up. Hello, welcome back, everybody. You're on mute, so I can't hear you, but I welcome you to unmute yourself, please. Um, and we'd just love to hear, I don't know if you all um, Believe me when I said I was going to do a breakout room report out and maybe be thinking about what were some of the key lessons that you heard that are really resonating or the things that people are really incorporating into your decision. Um, but let's start with breakout room one. If you remember what breakout room you were in or any willing volunteer is fine as well. Um, so those of you that if you did talk about a spokesperson, what were some of the um, lessons that really seemed to resonate that a lot of people were um, we're finding are relevant during this time of either doing digital events or digital fundraising to account for our new normal. Who'd like to share some we of that highlights? We were in breakout room one, and we we didn't pick a spokesperson or or come up with anything. But you've got to hear from Erica what our farm is doing. It's hilarious <laughs> and wonderful. All right, there we go, Erica. I don't think you can say no now. I, I guess not. Um, so. <laughs> We had to make a decision. Our, our largest fundraiser of the year is a week from today on the 19th. And we typically have a big event on the farm with a farm to table dinner. This year, people are picking up that meal and taking it home with them. And I was too afraid of technology to actually have streaming at that point. So, you know, you kind of get home, and you might want to stream. We're hoping people will go home, enjoy their dinner and relax. But we added a cow chip bingo and we are going to be live streaming that um, and the technology side of that is scaring me a lot um, but we are selling raffle tickets um, we have a licensed raffle through our permit with the police department and we we are we benefit because we are a farm and we have four cows so we set out a bingo grid and painted on the grass we let the cows go out and if the cow poops on your spot, you win $2,500. Um, but, wow. but what that has led to, and we talked on in our group, is this is a potential that we can offer other nonprofits because there's a number of golf tournaments in the fall that have been canceled. So it's the same. We have a $5,000 sponsor for this. Their banner is going to be on the end. So when we live stream, you see their banner. Um, we probably could have sold a lot more, um, and maybe in the future we will, but I think it will be, it will be, if we sell all the tickets, we'll have a really nice, profitable fundraiser that didn't cost us a lot. Um, and, you know, we've got to, so that, so that leads us to the last part we were talking about with Mary Jane's great videos. Do we all have resources as nonprofits that we can share? Um, right. if Mary Jane has someone that does great videos, um, is that someone we can borrow and have, and help us? And, you know, our farm, we have a lot of space for social distancing. Um, we have seven separate buildings. We have a place where you can go and you can commune with nature, relax, uh, regroup mentally. Um, we're here, we're here for all of you. So maybe there's a lot of things that we can share and help each other out during these tough times and collaborate. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Great, super fun, most unique fundraiser I've heard of. I'm glad I didn't have to actually ask what cow chip bingo was and you explained it. That makes me feel like a city girl or something. Um, <laughs> but I don't think I was the only one. I saw a lot of confused looks there. So super fun, thanks for sharing Erica. Um, one quick note, and then I'm going to turn it over to um, someone else to share some lessons that you heard about, you know, shifting to this new approach to fundraising, what you do differently next time, or what you're learning as you go. But I do want to just mention, you know, obviously the, the video that we shared from Interval House, I think we all had a similar reaction, which is, man, that was awesome, and it seemed glamorous, you know, the music and the graphics. And But remember um, that video doesn't have to be polished or fancy for it to be effective. It also doesn't have to be new. 
So if you have past videos that you've created about your organization, about the people you serve, about the services you offer, you know, you can reuse that content. People's attention span and retention of content is nil. Um, so think about what might you already have in your arsenal? Do you have any beneficiary stories? Do you have any um, volunteers who've, who've shared their story? Or are there ways that you could collect those direct to camera? You know, right now you've seen it in your advertising. If you're watching TV and you're seeing commercials, everybody is doing low-fi, low-budget um, videos right now with people, you know, talking direct to camera. And so don't feel intimidated um, by that example. You could be reusing something that's already in your content library, or you could be collecting something in a really authentic way from a volunteer, a beneficiary, a board member, direct to camera. Um, that could still have an impactful um, effect in the end. Okay, so with that little note, let me switch it over to maybe somebody, if you remember, if you were in breakout room two, um, is there somebody willing to share some, some of the lessons learned that seem to um, really resonate with folks in your breakout room? Or if you don't know what breakout room that you were in, you can share anyway. We were breakout room two and we elected Andrea to speak for us. Ooh, Tressa calling out Andrea, way to go. Love it. Okay, Andrea, <laughs> you're, okay. you're up. Okay, all right. Um, so um, it was a great conversation and um, we learned that, thank you, Tressa. <laughs> um, we learned that we've all been trying to figure out different ways in um, which we can communicate with the community and our partners and each other. And um, Tressa did a um, community engagement piece that uh, wasn't a wasn't a um, fundraiser or anything, but was really uh, really successful. And um, the amount of people who have been engaged was really great. And wanted to um, just been putting it out there to make sure that it's available for people to see. And now that she has done that, um, they feel comfortable in getting another um, event under their belt. So, and then maybe for profit for the future. And I know that Bill didn't do anything yet and is interested or maybe looking forward to doing something. And um, I know that Takesha, she said that she hasn't done anything, but you know, it's a good idea to probably start doing some stuff for the staff. And I shared that I did a couple of stuff. So we did a bingo event with our um, with our um, organization. We were supposed to do something in person. And so we did a bingo with uh, over a hundred people. It was really fun. We had, um, we had a lot of people online and we had a DJ, we had speakers, we had people winning um, gift cards. It was lots of fun and uh, people just really enjoyed it and thought it was fun. We also had a family event where people were able to, um, our families were able to, to join with us and um, enjoy different events where we played Uno, we played different events where the families and the kids were able to celebrate with us. So that was really enjoyable. Uh, we also had a tea party event uh, via Zoom. We had bake-offs, we had dance parties. So different things that allow us to engage and stay moving and stay connected, even though it's virtual. And our families love it, our kids love it. And it's a way for us to see each other. And some are fundraisers and some are just for us to see each other and enjoy the time that we have. And it, just because it's virtual doesn't mean that we can't engage and talk to each other and so those have been really fun for us and the kids look forward to them and so do we so um, that's what we've been doing that sounds can amazing I ask a question? Uh, thanks lindsay um so uh could we hear some more details on engaging the community through virtual events because that's actually a concern that we've had at the land bank which is how do we do an event? How do we do a virtual event knowing that many of our community members may not have access um, to Wi Fi even or, you know, broadband? Uh, I don't know all the fancy terms for high speed internet that you need to uh, be able to join a Zoom meeting and then just the, the skills or technology. So uh, I just wondered if we could hear some specific examples about community engagement virtually. Yeah, well, well, one is, I'm just going to say that I feel like, Andrea, to some extent, that's kind of what you were just speaking to and some of the examples that you were giving of like getting together on video and doing a dance party together or baking together or having a tea party together. 
um, but I want to also maybe hear from other folks, and I'm not sure, Tressa, maybe if you have something to share, I feel like you might have unmuted yourself there just for a moment. Um, the last thing I'll share before I turn it to Tressa is just, um, that I think that, Laura, that's one of the reasons we're seeing a lot of people using Zoom, is that even though there were some security concerns at first about Zoom, um, it's it was popular because it was very easy for folks to use, even if they don't have a you know, fancy desktop or a really high um, broadband connection. It tends to be a bit lower bandwidth and easier to join by like a smartphone or a tablet or a, a less expensive device. There is still the question of do people have a device at all? Right. Um, you know, and so that, that raises questions, but I think with Zoom meetings, we've seen that the barrier to join is a bit lower. Um, so just wanted to mention that. Tressa, would love to hear more from you as well. Yes, yeah, so we did a um, community concert and we had people send their videotaped performances in. We kind of picked 12 performers within our four towns that are kind of like local celebrities. Um, but we knew that, like you said, not everybody has access to Zoom Facebook, or even the internet. So we collaborated with our local um, community voice channel, which is like a local cable network, because although so many of us has, have like cut the cable, like we're like just streaming everything now, we did know there was a certain population of people that they love their cable, they love their community voice. And so working with them, they were able to help us edit and produce the show. Then they were able to put it up on their um, cable network, but also provide us with a YouTube link. So we did the night of the premiere. We were able to share that link and also host a Zoom premiere party. But now the, the Community Voice channel, I think they're running that concert. I think it's 15 times within the next six weeks. It's on their on-demand listing as well. So by working with them, we were able to put it on cable, have it on demand, have a YouTube link, do the Zoom um, premiere party. So we were just able to kind of hit upon all those. Now we didn't use it as a fundraiser. We kind of wanted to pilot it out, see how it went. But we feel like in the future, we could definitely kind of monetize that, sell tickets and, um, or even really promote our donation. Um, page on our website throughout the concert if we wanted to do that. We're thinking of maybe, we usually have a really large summer youth theater program, so that might be a good platform to move that for the end of the summer to have, you know, our show on that type of platform. So, so yeah, we just had to get through the logistics of obviously having um, releases from all the performers that they were open to being on all of these different platforms, which they had, they had no problem. They were all really, really excited to be part of our first concert. Yeah. And I think the other thing to, to be thinking about all of you, but to Laura's question is, um, you know, even folks with limited access, social media tends to be really popular um, and social media videos tend to be, you know, a minute or less. And so are there ways to use social media to continue to engage where we know a lot of people are going anyway? Um, or, you know, instead of the live virtual event, which might require a different level of training um, or connectivity to Laura's point, you know, if you, if you pre-record some things or invite people to share via social media, then they can kind of watch on their own time. It's not as um, bandwidth heavy. You know, they're not <clears throat> doing a joint video call with, with 20, 30, 100 people at once. They're just watching a video that educates them about your organization, the people you serve, the cause you support, et cetera, in a, um, a more asynchronous way that still allows for engagement um, and consumption, but in a, a less tech heavy way. Andrea, you so, unmuted, so I'm thinking you have something to share there as well. I'm yeah. good now. I'm like really watching people. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, to your point, that is exactly what we've done. Done. So we called, so we serve about 200, 250, 300 uh, parents. So when everything started, we called every single parent and we, t we asked them, what is the best way that we can connect with you? And um, we also made sure we, we uh, verify who spoke another language, how we can help them. And we did just that. And after we did that, we found ways that we can communicate with them. And so the, most parents said that they have Facebook, they follow us on Facebook, so on and so forth. So the short of it is that on Mondays on our Facebook page, we have 
our mentors reading books to our, our students. And so they can have access to that because we knew the libraries weren't available um, at the time. And then we worked, we're currently partnering now with the Harper Library and they have the resource. So we even have Zoom, the kids are mentoring on Zoom and one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So we have, a, um, we have them where they are getting uh, read to and the books are recorded and on our, our Facebook page and our, our um, Instagram page. We we also have on Friday, every Friday, there's a video that's teaching them how to do something that they can use all the materials at home. This morning, I just uploaded a video how to do edible cookie dough. Um, and it's all the stuff that they can do at home. So, so far since March, we've done um, a video every Monday, every um, Thursday, and every Friday. Um, so they know that those videos are there. In addition, if they wanted to do any um, academic support, we send them a message every day that the academic support is on our website by tell, sending them a recording saying, so and we start, we just gave them a phone call and that's how we keep in touch with them. And that's how we knew how to reach, reach them with their, with their resources. So that's what we did. And it's a great reminder, Andrea, thank you for sharing so many wonderful and rich examples there. But what I love about what you said um, more than anything is that you just started by asking. Where are you and how can we help you? How can we reach you? You know, it's so smart to remember, like, who are, who's our audience? Who are we trying to reach? And let's actually ask them, how, how can we help you during this time? You know, and, and where can we help you during this time? So that's a great reminder. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. Whoops, I skipped that slide. I didn't mean to. Um, I want to have us close out here so you have a chance. We're already starting to talk about virtual programs and service delivery as well, which is great. So that's a wonderful segue into our next. Um, breakout. Um, but before we do, just kind of to close out our talk about fundraising and engagement, um, uh, virtual events in particular, um, many of you, again, are already starting to make these, these shifts. So continue talking to your board, your sponsors, and your major donors, of course, your staff, about options. Um, again, you don't want to if your event is completely sponsor driven and you've got, you know, a, a platinum level sponsor that's giving you 15 grand and they expect it to be a certain way or 25 grand, they expect it to be a certain way based on past experience, you know, make sure that you're keeping them in the loop in terms of how you're planning on adjusting that. And if they're still comfortable with the benefit of sponsorship that they'll get if that event moves from in person to virtual. Again, many of you are already doing this. But if you're not, review your contracts with any venues or vendors um, if, for in-person events and with attorneys if need be. And, and we started to talk about quite a bit of this in this last, last section, but understand what tools you might already have in your toolkit that could help you with a virtual event, whether that the CRM or client um, re relationship management tools or donor management tools that you might already be using that might have some um, auction functionality or silent auction functionality or text to give functionality or who knows virtual event functionality um, peer to peer fundraising tools could be a part of the existing tools that you have. So understand what might already be in your toolkit that could include the broadcasting tools like you know using zoom to go live or Facebook live or YouTube. Um, or even Teams Live, Microsoft Teams Live, um, it could be that you already have a lot of the tools that you need and it's a matter of maybe working with a skilled volunteer or a, a, a savvy staff person that's interested to understand um, how to use them for this. And then also that point I was making about Mary Jane's video as an example, think about what stories or videos might already be in your arsenal so you're not having to think about producing something net new all the time, but maybe resurfacing and repurposing existing content that you have. Okay, so again, we've already started talking a little bit about pivoting programs and services to virtual. I think um, Andrea and Tressa just both, both gave some great examples of this. Um, really, there's no silver bullet or kind of magic formula here. This gets back to like, Kind of what Andrea was saying about understanding your audience, understanding what they need, understanding how you can add value. Um, this is more of a strategic planning question than anything. So as you think about, you know, what you've already switched to virtual, um, and again, many of you are already here and are already doing this, but thinking about how you can either lean into what you've already switched or what might be next. Think about what are the programs and services that are the main drivers of your organization? You know, what are the absolutely essential services or programs that you offer that also maybe are very connected to your ability to earn revenue or um, to actually have societal impact? 
right? So think about what drives our business both financially, but also in terms of the, our ability to have impact on the communities that we serve. And when we think about that probably is a list of maybe two to five programs or services that are the most important, like now is the time to prioritize those and to be thinking, have we already moved them virtual? Is it working? If we haven't already moved them virtual, what would it look like to move them virtual? But always to take that cue from Andrea and Connecticut of understanding, but is our audience going to be there? And that was kind of Laura's question, like how do we design something that can meet our audience where they are? Um, and what, again, what existing tools might we have to help us do that? This is not always about fancy technology. It might be about social media. It might be about using Zoom calls or things like that um, or other virtual tools to keep um, engaging folks. So, um, and once you've started to move those services virtual with many, which many of you have, thinking about, you know, what, what parts of this might we want to keep for the long term? What tends to be working well? Um, and again, you've already started to hear some examples, but I know that there's a lot more examples out there. Um, and so rather than talk at you about this, I'd love to turn it over to you for another 10 minute breakout session um, for you all to share either what are the examples you've seen or you've done yourself of shifting to virtual programs and service delivery. Uh, what are what seem to be the success factors? And as always, what are you learning? So I'm going to recreate some new breakout rooms and give you another 10 minutes to just talk amongst yourselves about what are you seeing or what are you doing and what are you learning. Before I have you move to breakout rooms, are there any questions about what I'm going to ask you to do? Okay, and when we come back from breakout rooms, I'll look for a couple of quick highlights from each of you of some examples that are working or what you're learning. Um, we'll, and we'll mix that in with any final questions that you have as we near the, the home stretch of our session here. So when you come back, bring your questions, bring your highlights from the session. Um, and without further ado, let me stop talking and put you all into breakout rooms. We're 14 now, there's four staff, that means there's 10 of us. I think this time I'm gonna do a slightly bigger breakout room. So I'm gonna put you in two breakout rooms this time. So let me recreate. We'll do two because there's four staff people here. Yeah, so that will be five people each. Hi, all, welcome back. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it right back over to you. Who's got, um, it was just two breakout rooms that time. So I know you both started five and five or once we got everybody situated, it was five and five. And I think we had one person drop midway through. Um, any other highlights of how people are reinventing program and service delivery um, nuggets of lessons learned or great examples that folks want to share. I'm going to open it up, but before I do um, and have you um, share some of those highlights back with us, um, I just want to remind you that we can keep this discussion going on the Facebook group, or I should say you can. I, um, I exited so that I wasn't an interloper on your Facebook group, but there have already been so many great examples and ideas and resources shared, including by Hartford Foundation staff, like Mayor mentioned, the Pro Bono Partnership as a free legal resource in the chat. So just remember that um, it seems like there's just um, really great appetite, more than we have time for, to share all this. So I encourage you to keep using that Facebook group in addition to the highlights that I hope you'll share now. So um, any other great nuggets that are coming up out as you're thinking about shifting to virtual programs and service delivery? Who'd like to share? Share, it's more of a, of an epiphany. I guess I would say. So I was just sharing in our breakout room, I think we were breakout two, that yesterday, I, so I think about things when they hit me in threes, it's like I'm supposed to do it, right? So yesterday I was just thinking, we need a YouTube channel and I just need to start doing videos and whatever we do with the videos and how we clip them or whatever, I just need that. And then in our breakout group, Mary Jane started talking about how she just kind of took an iPhone and recorded an issue that was happening in her facility and raised $20,000 from it. So it's just this whole point about saying, thinking of like we, we're communicating constantly on Zoom, but there's a room and a space for us to create video and programming and information that can be on demand, that people can use and engage with whenever they feel, feel necessary and in the seats and the place that they are, but still gets our message out, gets our purpose heard, gets the things that we need accomplished. So I, I just thank you for today because this is amazing. Yay! 
and it's all you sharing with each other. Yeah, not everything has to be synchronous or live, right? There's asynchronous and there's synchronous. And people probably are actually getting burnt out on the synchronous, on this freaking always having to be on Zoom calls. So I think it's great to keep exploring that. Good. Other like aha moments or, or learnings as you're shifting to uh, virtual or, um, yeah, virtual program or service delivery. Sorry. Well, I want to share what Mary Jane said that, you know, we don't need a professional to do it. How she described her her little program was setting her iPhone up on a tripod and then just talking to it. And we did our a virtual tour here at the museum with just an iPhone. And the teacher said it was the best tour that they've ever had. But again, it was just one staff member filming another staff member with an iPhone. You know, so people aren't, you're right, people aren't looking for perfection. They're looking for the real us. Authenticity always is what matters, particularly on social and in video. Um, it doesn't have to be polished and perfect, and especially not now. People are eager to hear authentic, real stories of the people you're serving, the cause you're defending, and, 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 and the, the issues that you care about. Yeah, and, and the way we consume this kind of content is definitely very authentic and, and lo-fi. Lo Good. Um, maybe one more, and then we'll open it up to any other um, pent-up questions or, or ideas that folks want to share. Any other kind of nuggets or highlights that came out of that um, breakout session? Okay, well, those are definitely some good ones for sure. Um, let me just do one final screen share. Um, and I'm just gonna, again, kind of wrap up with some things that I think you've all shared with each other as advice, um, but just to kind of put a fine point on it. So as you're thinking about your programs and service delivery online, what I, what I don't have on my slide, but what we've heard from you is, remember that these don't have to be highly produced solutions. When it, like, you know, we called this a technology session, but really a lot of what we're talking about are not heavy tech solutions. It's just about being creative and authentic and finding ways to engage and get your message out there. So it's not about figuring out some fancy, you know, fundraising solution or service delivery solution or efforts to outcomes or things like that. It's just about understanding what's the message that we have to share and how can we get it out there and reach people with it authentically. In addition to that, some other things that you might be thinking about now, um, do some process mapping of your mission critical processes, and is there an opportunity to automate those or to streamline those so that as you're making time to invent and reinvent um, new ways of delivering, you're also optimizing the, you know, the back-end work that you might have to do to process a new volunteer or to do client intake or to thank a donor. Um, we talked about this already, but assessing key programs and services and how you may pivot them to virtual. Brainstorming new services. I was saying while you all were in breakout rooms with the Hartford staff, Hartford Foundation staff, that it's amazing to hear the ingenuity um, and the, the experimentation that you're all doing and you're learning and you're putting yourselves out there and you're finding new ways. Um, so keep brainstorming and doing that. It's amazing. And then also, as you get more into this, and the longer that you're doing things virtual, don't forget to prioritize efforts to outcomes. And think about how can we either um, prioritize things that will actually be able to help us earn revenue or things that we can monetize, or things that are really making a difference in terms of the people we're trying to serve or the cause we're trying to create impact on. Um, and so just a few other things to keep in mind. Um, and with that, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I'd love to open it up to any other questions or ideas or discussions that you would all like to share with one another. I, I think for, for at least for me and certainly in our, our breakout room, you know, the, the more you, you talk about this opportunity, the more ideas, um, come to you. Uh, we certainly, I, I know that we can, uh, as an overused word, pivot our community education and be more effective with kids in the schools about family violence than what we're doing now. What we're doing now is a one-off and that's great and it's, 
it's, I guess, of value, but, but we need to be constant and present all of the time. So this is an opportunity to do that. It's an opportunity to, um, to, for me to pull together my staff and say, okay, I'm gonna have three of you talk about domestic violence, what it is, what are the resources, and we'll just put it out there. We, there are so many new things that we can do. They are essentially cost-free and they raise awareness and they do good things when they float out there in the community. And it's just, um, I, you know, I'm classically a, a glass is half full kind of person, but um, I really look at this as an opportunity that, that we will all come to um, seize and, and it will grow and evolve and, and be good for all of us. That's a, just a wonderful note. I hate to talk anymore, but Bill, Bill put in a good question, so I want to raise it, and you all can keep talking about it in the Facebook group. For simple videos, what's the best software for editing, captioning, et cetera? Any tips on video features, what video features work best for social media? Um, I'll start, and I would love for other people to chat back to Bill or, or unmute. I know we're going to have to drop soon. But Bill, you know, I think I heard Mary Jane say that her video for the live event was shot on um, an iPhone. Of course, that was live, but I think a lot of people are using iPhones, um, and they're using iMovie or whatever the built-in software is with iPhones. So, like, really simple built-in um, video editing stuff. If you're not on an iPhone and you're on an Android, I've heard of people using a free tool called Animoto, or there's even a tool called Windows Movie Maker. It's a little dated, but I think it's still available um, for really light light editing. Um, but I think some other folks, yeah, there's Animoto. Great, Tressa. I even said that before I saw that, so I'm glad we're on the same. Yeah, and iMovie as well, Andrea is using as well. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> I know we're right at the hour. Um, welcome anybody that I can stay on for a bit longer. I know you all might have to drop and keep doing the amazing things that you're doing. Um, I'll just say, and I think this session was honestly such a great manifestation of, of this slide, which we talked about on session one, but technology is rarely the full problem or the full solution. And everything I've heard today just kind of reinforces this. It's about a little bit about the technology, but a lot of it's about the people and the training and um, tapping your subject matter experts to share their wisdom, to be creative. And it's about the cultures and the policy and processes that, that make these things go. But, you know, I'm, I'm so inspired by everything I've heard you all say today, and, and none of it is really deeply technical. Certainly sometimes it is, but for the session we had today, a lot of it is about, you know, people and training and culture, policy, and process. Um, and so I'll stick around if there are other questions. But, um, and I see that there's another great suggestion for Filmora in the chat as a movie editing tool for $40 a year. Um, but thank you again for those of you that are going to drop. Um, for, for coming back um, and sharing more ideas. I'm so glad you did. So much great um, energy and, and ideas shared today. I continue to wish you well, stay safe, and um, keep kicking butt because you are finding new ways to do it. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm proud to be able to be a part of it and to, and to hear what you're all doing. So good luck and stay well. Bye, everyone. If you're dropping by, if you need any questions, I'm here. Otherwise, thanks, and have a great Friday and a great weekend ahead. Thank you, Lindsay. Thanks, Andrea. C congrats to you. I love hearing what you were doing. It was really awesome. Thank you. I don't want to hold you. I had I, I had one question. So sure, I know um, I asked you the last session about the teams and um, uh, yeah, and I went and I tried to ex so I did expand. So sorry to hold you, Mayor. Um, I tried. No worries. No worries. Okay, I tried to expand and I put in my so I put in my regular team and my board and my mentors and so on and I try to um I did a lot of research and it's working really well but I did a lot of research and it keeps telling me that it cannot it's not it's not pulling anyone from you know like say I put in Lindsay at yahoo.com it's not recognizing that person even though I put in all of the settings to allow outsiders 
Um, and as, I as guests to your team options. So what, yeah. So I don't know if you had any thoughts on, am I doing something wrong? So you're, you're adding guests and you're putting in their specific email addresses and you're inviting them to your team, yes. but it doesn't seem like they're, they're able to join. Right. Um, do you know, are they taking the action on their side? Because in order for me to come into your teams as a guest, I have to accept the invitation that you've given me. So I have to say, yes, go visit the channel or something like that. Okay. So, so, so there's, go ahead. I was going to say, it could be a couple things. It, it could be number one, and this is something that I'm not technical enough to fully understand. It could have something to do with what version of Office 365 license you're using because there are different levels of Office 365 license. There's the free one, which is called E1. Then there's a paid one, which is called e E3, super great naming. And then there's a more expensive one called E5. It could be that maybe to have guests, you have to be on you know E3 or E5 instead of on E1. So it could depend on what version you're on. Or it could be that you're doing it right, but we need to make sure that the person who's getting the invite is actually accepting and saying, yes, I want to visit her, her team site as a guest. Okay. Um, we do have the paid business version. I will check to see which, if it's E3 or E5, and I will check. It won't even accept me. Put, it, won't, it's, it will not accept me putting in the email. So I will check if it's E3 or E5, but I do know okay. our entire system is set up as Office 365. I love Office. I love Teams. Um, I'm, right. I'm pretty good with it. Um, I just, that's the only area that I have not used with the outside as, as in our board. I really wanted right. to kind of get um, them on that platform because I like using Teams with that's how our entire office communicate. We talk via team. Uh, we don't text or any of that. We just, that's how we talk every day. And that's how we drop right. files to, to each other. That's how we work on files. So it's really, really convenient and it's just really productive. So that's how I wanted right. to kind of work with our board. And, you know, it's really helpful for our board because they vary in technical skills and it's a good way to kind of help them to develop those skills as well. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I thought I said, you know, let me ask, see if you, because I did a lot of research and of course, though they have some support there, I wasn't able to um, get through it. Uh, so and, and was that like self-service support? Was it you looking at the like help online and things like that? So the one other thing I would try, because it's, um, as you know, it's always kind of hard to, to troubleshoot tech problems unless you're in the system. So I don't know if you set up the system yourself or if you had help setting it up, if you had help setting